Welcome back to I Can Do That. I'm Andrew, the editor of Popular Woodworking, and today we're going to turn this beautiful piece of maple into a coffee table. Uh, now, as you can see, this uh, looks like it pretty much just came right off the tree. Um, and a piece of wood like this isn't something you can just go down to your home center and buy. Uh, I went on Craigslist, uh, found a couple of local sawyers in my area, went and visited a couple, um, and found this piece of wood that I really liked. And uh, surprisingly, it wasn't that expensive. I think I paid a couple hundred bucks uh, for this slab of maple. Now, as you can see, the maple itself, it's rough. It looks like it just pretty much came off the sawmill. Um, this one has been kiln dried down to about 9% moisture content. Um, and you can also see that as part of the, the drying process, we've got some checks forming in the ends that we're going to stabilize, but there are also some, what some would call major defects in here. There's a, there's a big crack. Uh, you can see that uh, we've got the uh, backside of a knot here or a branch. We're going to stabilize and highlight those defects. Uh, the goal here is to preserve as much of the natural character of the slab as we can. Um, the other big task is uh, turning this uh, roughly milled, dried slab into something that's nice and flat and stable. You can see that it's rocking back and forth here. And to do that, we're going to use what's called a router sled and our router. It's a little bit labor intensive, but it goes a lot more quickly uh, than you might expect, especially on video. So stay tuned and we'll get going on that sled. So our router sled is made up of two parts. We have uh, rails and a carriage. And as you can see here for the rails, I've just got two pieces of lumber uh, butted together here to make a, an L. Now for this lumber, I sprung for the premium stuff. I wanted nice straight square boards because this is going to be a reference surface for the carriage that rides along the top to give you a nice flat surface. Uh, so again, I just um, countersunk a couple screws, a few screws in each one. I'm gonna finish doing that and then move on to the carriage. So now that we have our rails assembled, we can work on the carriage. I've already put together one side of the carriage here so we can see how it works. You can see it's just sort of a, a T-shape and that's going to contain the router as you're working. So the router will ride through the middle of this um, and uh, conveniently I've I'll put it together so my base prevents the router bit from actually biting into the side of the carriage. And so we're going to do this uh, on the other side too. Um, one thing you want to keep in mind though is that um, your base may have an auxiliary handle or other things on it that um, could get in the way of your carriage. Uh, your base could also be a totally different size. Our carriage is going to be about 10 inches wide depending on what router you have and what base and what bit you're using. Um, you may need to make some adjustments. So I'm going to go ahead and get uh, the other side of this assembled. We'll put on a couple of end pieces. And then it's time to flatten our slab. So I've sized my carriage so the fence is actually inset three quarters of an inch from the end. It's crazy how that all works out. But that means I can use a couple pieces of, of plywood as a spacer in order to attach it all together. Uh, you can also see on my plywood, uh, this is construction grade, so it's got one pretty good face and one not so good face. I'm going to use the good faces on the edges that connect with the router to make sure everything stays nice and smooth. So I'm just going to set up my fence here, square the ends up, and uh, countersink a couple screws in there. And then once you have one screw in, it makes things a lot easier to assemble throughout the rest of it. Come over here, put one in. <clears throat> and then you do want to put a good number of screws in the bottom. Make sure you countersink them because it's going to be riding on a rail. Um, but the screws are what's going to keep these uh, bottom pieces of the carriage nice and, and flat and strong. So I'll probably put uh, eight or ten screws in this bottom piece. There we 
go. Perfect. Just going to pop that up on the rails. So now we have the two fences of our carriage. The last thing we're going to do is attach a couple ends. And you can see that the bottom of the end overhangs so it won't ride off of our rails. We'll go ahead and do that, and then we can get set up for flattening our slab. So once we have our carriage and rails assembled, it's time to set up to get started working. Now my slab was too big for my workbench, so I'm using a solid core door about 40 inches wide uh, as my platform. You could very easily use uh, a four by eight sheet of plywood, or I've even seen people try to do this on the ground, but that's a little too backbreaking for my taste. So you can see we've got our rails, we've clamped them on either side, and then we have our carriage that slides back and forth, and then the router slides in the carriage and takes off a couple of passes that'll create a nice flat surface. Now I did build my rails oversized because I wasn't quite sure how thick I wanted my slab to be. Once I had it all set up, I noticed that I had too much space between the carriage and the slab, uh, too much that my router bit couldn't take multiple passes. So I ripped the rails down to about two and a half inches wide. That's a, a good lesson to keep in mind too, because these slabs, if you say you want a two inch thick slab, it'll probably be inch and three quarters to two and a half inches thick um, throughout because uh, of the drying process and the milling process. So, before we fire up the router and start flattening the slab, the last thing we want to do is shim it and hold it in place. As you can see, that the slab rocks a little bit here. Now my goal is I'm going to shim it from both sides so I don't have to take too much off of either side. And then I'm going to um, use a couple of screws and wood blocks to hold it down and block it in place. So I've already shimmed the other end and put in my stop block, um, but you can still see over here that there's still some wobble in the slab. Uh, so I've just got some uh, thin pieces of stock over here, scrap. Um, if you have shims too, those work really well from the home improvement store. Uh, and I'm just going to shim these in place. You can tell that there's still space here, but as you come over, yeah, that, that seems to work pretty well. And then I'm just going to toss a screw in these shims to hold them in place because we don't want them shifting while we're routing. sure that works. There we go, do one more wiggle test. And then I'm just gonna snug this block up uh, right to the end here. And that should hold our slab firmly in place. So we've got our slab uh, held firmly in place, it's shimmed. We've got our carriage and our rails moving freely. Now comes the fun part. It's time to power on our 40 inch planer. So when I say 40 inch planer, I obviously don't mean 40 inch planer. Basically what we have is this three quarter inch straight bit. So by a straight bit, it's straight on the bottom and that's gonna allow us to take a three quarter inch pass back and forth across the slab, across the entire thing. It's gonna take a little while but it actually delivers a pretty good surface and we know that it's gonna be truly flat. Um, so we've got our three quarter inch bit here and the next thing we wanna do is think about how, uh, how deep we want our bit to be cutting. Um, because the slab obviously isn't flat, we wanna check for the high point and we'll use that as our first reference for setting our bit depth. Um, and I'm just gonna use the guide rails here to see where the high point in the slab is. It looks like it's in this area over here. You can kind of tell there's a little bit of a hump. Um, and actually, actually there is a little bit of wire embedded in this slab. It looks like uh, copper uh, wire, like Romex. You can see some plastic and some copper there. Um, now, if it were any other type of metal than copper, I'd be a little bit more worried, but because we have a carbide bit in our router, uh, the copper's not gonna do too much to it. It's softer than the bit and the plastic too. So we're just gonna go for it. But if it were steel, um, a lot of times you'll find uh, nails or even um, bullets in, in slabs like this. You'd probably wanna try and dig them out.
So now it's time to uh, pop our router in the carriage and start taking some passes. And we're gonna start down here at this end because that's our high end. So I've got my router in position over that high point in the slab and I'm just gonna adjust my bit down. So it's just touching it there bring my router back. Yeah, we'll take off probably just a hair at this point. We'll need probably need to do two or three passes on each side of the slab to get it nice and flat. So here in production, we'll plug our router in, let the chips fly. So you can see here uh, where I started taking off the high spot, you can see the area where it was routed, but as you can see here, I started not being able to get anything off. So I'm gonna go down to this end and see if there's anything else on this pass that I can take off. We'll lower our bit and do another pass. So this is uh, the end of my second pass. You can see I started taking off quite a bit of material on the right side of this slab, um, but it's important to go through the whole slab um, I'm not actually running the router through the whole slab, but I'm making sure that I'm grabbing any high points with the bit. You can see up here in this upper left-hand corner, um, I caught some there too. So I'm gonna lower my bit a little bit more, probably about eighth of an inch, do another pass and keep going. There we have it, a uh, nice flat side. So this is the first side. Just gonna clean up, flip it over. We won't need to shim it because we have a perfectly flat side and then do it again on the back side. After this, it's time to build the base. So now that we have our top done, it's time to talk about the base. Um, the base is gonna be made up of an offcut from the slab and then some pieces of red oak. Now this is five quarter red oak um, that I bought at the Home Improvement Center. So it's actually only one inch thick, um, but it's nice and sturdy and I think it's gonna um, complement the thickness of the tabletop. So the base itself is pretty simple. We're gonna be using half laps and notches to put it all together so there's a good mechanical joint there that will reinforce with glue and some screws. So if you can imagine the base being upside down here, um, we'll be having our off cut and um, our legs all be part of the base, and then we'll have a, another horizontal stretcher over here. So this will be notched into these two boards. This will be notched in here, and then we'll put our legs on the front. And we're gonna do a little bit of bevel on the front of the legs, and we'll do a bevel on the back side as well. So let's grab that table saw and start cutting some notches. 
So the first thing we're going to do is cut all of the notches uh, for our base. Now, the notches themselves, I'd like to be half the depth of our pieces here. So our oak pieces are all two and three quarters of an inch wide. So that means our notch needs to be an inch and three eighths deep. So I went ahead and measured out on the board an inch and three eighths up from the bottom. And then I'm going to use that to set my blade height. Now I do have the table saw unplugged because I'm messing with the blade. So we're all safe. So I'll just raise that up and then I'll just move the blade a little to test it. I'd say that looks pretty good. So then the next thing we want to do um, is still using our test piece. We know our notches need to be the thickness of one of our pieces here. So I'm going to, uh, pop the piece on there and trace the edges. And that'll help us set up our notching cuts. Pretty good. So we've got our notch there. And that's what we'll use to line up with the edges of the blade. Now we're gonna wanna cut inside of our pencil line and kind of sneak up on things. So I'll be making a cut here and here, and then I'll just nibble out the middle with a blade. So I'm going to plug in the table saw make a test notch and see how things fit. All right, a little moment of truth here. See if that fits in there. It does, it's a little bit loose. Um, so I think uh, as I cut my real ones, I'm just going to adjust for that just a little bit. So I'll go ahead and cut the notches in my oak pieces. I'm also going to be cutting notches in the maple end piece. So there's going to be a little bit of layout involved in that. So now I'm going to be laying out the notches on my uh, maple leg here. And I know that I want the ends of the notches to be 18 inches apart, which is why I'm using the actual stretcher we're using for the base. So I'm going to put my first line on one end, another line on the other. Then I'll come in here with my handy width block and put in another reference line on the insides. And then I'll just use those to line up my notches on the table saw. One of the things I like about using the sled is you know exactly where your blade is because you've got the kerf right there. So I'm using that to line up my first cut. So we've got our notches roughed out for our leg and our cross stretcher. The next thing we want to do is uh, do our other two legs. And we're going to attach those using a half lap. So we want the legs to be coming down in the front like this. And what we're going to do is nibble away half the thickness of each of those boards so when they come together, they'll still be the same thickness as this board. So I've set my blade height on the table saw to half the thickness of this one inch lumber, half inch. And I'm just going to mark out the legs and start cutting. So I actually need to use the thickness or the width of one of these pieces to mark that out. There. I'll do the same thing on this piece. And I'll need to bring those around the corner with the square. That way I can see them when I'm making my cuts.
And now it's just time to cut. So I'm gonna line up to make this first cut and then I'll just nibble away and we'll cut the whole thing. So there we've got our first half lap, and then we need to put another one on each of these stretchers. So we finished cutting our half laps for our legs, and that completes all of the joinery for the base. Now we get to do the fun stuff, uh, which we're gonna add a little bit of a taper uh, to the front legs. It's tapering down from the bottom of the rail to about halfway through the foot. And then we're also gonna throw a little bit of a taper on the back here, so on the other side of the slab leg, you'll have a little bit of an angle. Now, if you have a, a bandsaw, that's a great use for this. Uh, we're gonna be using our jigsaw. I'm just gonna, gonna clamp this up here and cut out these legs. So I've uh, just spent the last, I don't know, a million hours <laughs> sanding the slab. Um, after the router, uh, after our first pass with the router, um, there were some ridges, but it was mostly flat and then it was all sanding after that. Um, then I went ahead and started working on some bow ties. So I put one in here. Now the bow tie, um, the grain is perpendicular. Uh, the bow tie's grain is perpendicular to the grain in the maple slab. And the way it's shaped is going to stop the slab from expanding and cracking anymore. So I put a bo uh, bow tie here. I've got two on the back and then I'm going to do one more on the front and I'll show you how to do that right now. So the bow tie uh, gets its name from its shape. It's shaped like a bow tie. Now I cut these out with a jigsaw, um, but if you have a bandsaw or even a table saw, um, those can also help you cut out bow ties. Inlaying the bow tie is, is a pretty cool process actually. Uh, you trace the outside um, I use a router to hog out most of the waste and then I come back and refine it with a chisel, fit it in there, a little bit of glue. Um, I'll plane off the top and then sand it down and it'll be nice and flush. Um, so you can see I've got a pretty good sized crack. It runs all the way, almost all the way through the slab. So on the back, I've got a bow tie kind of toward the end. Then I've got another one up here. So I've got my first bow tie on the top here and so I'm thinking I'm gonna to wanna to put a bow tie right about here. So that way we've got bow ties kind of throughout the crack and hopefully it won't crack anymore. Although with wood, you never know. It's got a mind of its own sometimes. So I'm just going to trace out the shape of my bow tie. And the trickiest part is not actually moving the bow tie while you're tracing out your shape. You can see there, and then I'm just gonna come in with my router, and I'll probably make two or three passes because I can't go the full depth of the bow tie with the router. Um, quickly, I just wanna talk about the router bit. Um, I'm using a quarter inch router bit. I also have an eighth inch router bit I use sometimes, um, but the smaller the router bit, the closer you can get to the corners of your bow tie, and the less chisel work you have to do. Um, now, this isn't a, a traditional plunge base, so I've got my router bit extended a little bit, and I'm just going to lean it into the meat of the cut there.
I just want to keep the sawdust out of there so I can still see my pencil lines. So you can see I've got one side done. I'll do the other side and make a few more passes. So after you've uh, routed out your bow tie here, you wanna come in and clean it up with a chisel. You wanna try and keep your walls nice and straight. And uh, this is hard maple, um, so it is uh, useful to have a nice set of chisels. We actually have these from our sponsor, Woodcraft. Thank you, Woodcraft. These are Wood River chisels available at your local Woodcraft store. Um, but I've really uh, put them through their paces on this project here. So just get that cleaned up. You want to have these bow ties as clean as you can. Try to get as much debris out of the hole here before we glue it up. All right. Do a little test fit. You don't want to go too far, but Eh, it looks pretty good. So now I'm just gonna apply some glue to the insides of the bow tie. Uh, I guess you'd call that a bow tie mortise. And uh, then we can drive our bow tie home. Make sure I've got it lined up. Goes in. There we go, okay. And uh, again, we're using our Tight bond one here. Um, I like to put a little bit on a piece of scrap and then use a flux core or a flux brush, I guess these are called. Um, you can get them in your plumbing supply section, but they make really good, cheap glue brushes. So I'm just painting the walls of the bow tie here. And then the most satisfying part of this whole process is coming right up here. So we'll position our bow tie, get it started. Then grab a scrap and a big mallet. And we'll drive it home. All right, so you can see that the bow tie is still a little proud of the surface. So I like to clean up most of that with a block plane and then we'll come back and sand it. So now that I have all of my angles and bevels cut, I'm going to glue up these half laps. Um, the glue's going to need to set a little bit, and then we can finish gluing up the rest of the base. Now the beautiful part about half laps is that they pretty much align themselves, and I only need one clamp there. So it should be pretty straightforward glue up. I'd also like to take this time to thank our sponsor, Typebond. We really appreciate you sponsoring I Can Do That, and we use Typebond on all of our builds. So I'm just going to spread the glue out here in the half lap. Might have been a little generous with the glue, but that's better than not enough. Make sure we get a nice, strong glue joint there. Pop our piece on, and then we just need to throw a clamp on. Make sure it stays nice and square. A little bit of glue running off there. Wipe that up, no one will be the wiser. So we'll let that leg cure, 
and I'll do the other one, and then we'll glue up the rest of the base. So I went ahead and glued up the rest of the base. Um, you can see I actually didn't put any clamps in over here on these notches because they fit nice and tight. So I just threw some glue in those, put them up, and then uh, glued in the stretcher over here. Now I also did it on a nice, flat, stable surface, so I know my base is going to be nice and solid. Just go ahead and remove these clamps. And then um, on the base, you can see that I added a, a kerf here and on the inside of the maple. And that's because we're going to use these uh, Z-clips to attach the top. And the Z-clip just slides in that channel, the screw goes into the top, and then the top can expand and contract widthwise as the seasons change. So the last thing we need to do is to throw our top on the bench, attach the top, and step back and take a look. So then we we'll want to flip our base over and attach it to our tabletop here. Now it is a natural slab, so um, there's not a great place to measure from as far as centering goes. So we're just going to eyeball it here. And let's see. So um, this side is actually where this part of the slab came from. So I'm going to keep that over here. And then I'd say that looks pretty good. Um, got our bow ties over there. Cool. So put that there, and then we get to attach our Z clips. So as I mentioned earlier, they just go into this channel down here, and we just pop a screw in. And that'll hold the top nice and firmly on, but it'll still allow it to expand and contract. So I'm going to put three on each side here. All right, just do a quick little lift test. All right, so you can see here is our table fully assembled. Now I still have a little bit of sanding to do. Um, that's probably the most labor intensive part of this project. Um, but I wanna show you what the top looks like with a little bit of finish on it. So I'm gonna throw some mineral spirits on here and you'll be able to see the uh, beautiful colors in this slab. It's my, my favorite part of this project. Seeing, you can see how once the finish hits things, the color just really starts to come up. And you can see there's light maple, there's dark streaks, there's a little bit of blue. Um, you know, we've got this lovely Romex over here with some copper inlay that uh, wasn't on purpose. And then you can see the contrast with the uh, walnut bow ties in there too. So I'm gonna let this evaporate, get back to sanding and we'll see you next time and I can do that.